Good afternoon and, and many thanks for attending our uh, webinar this afternoon. Uh, David and I are going to take you through a, 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 an introduction to the Property Franchise Group, uh, talk about our results that we've just released and, and talk about our growth plans for the future. Um, so without further ado, uh, we'll, we'll jump into the presentation. So a little bit about us. So what, what do we do? Property Franchise Group PLC is one of the largest franchise property businesses in the UK. And we'll touch on some numbers in the key stats section a little bit later. What's our vision? It's to achieve an increased UK market share of the lettings market, the estate agency transaction market, and property related financial services market using a proven franchise model and multiple clearly differentiated property brands. What are those brands? So we have two national brands, Martin and Co. Um, and you move, um, and then four regional brands, CJ Holdown. Um, in the Bristol area, Ellis & Co in and around London, Parkers, Oxfordshire, and White Gates in the north of England, which also has the ability to grow to a national brand. Some key statistics for you. Um, we as a group look after 58,000 tenanted managed properties, and that's on the increase year on year. And we take in, through our franchisees, £93 million in rent. So £93 million generated by the network in 2019. And that network of about 230 offices employ 2,250 people across the group as at the end of 2019. So that gives you some indication as to the size and the scale and, 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 and how we operate within the group. Um, to give you get a little bit of background in the group, a little uh, infographic with the history of the group. So Richard Martin, our chairman and uh, founder of the business, um, opened up a lettings agency under the Martin & Co brand in 1986 in Yeovil and operated successfully there. Um, and at the same time, sort of researched the franchise market and you know came up with the idea of launching um, a franchise lettings business and opened the first franchise in 1995. Over the next 12 years, Richard and, and our, our ex, uh, recently exited CEO, Ian Wilson, uh, built that business to 100 franchised offices um, during that period. Um, in 2012, we launched a residential sales service. So up until 2012, we were exclusively um, in the lettings market. We believe there was growth within the residential sales market and therefore launched the sales service in 2012. Um, in 2013, Martin Co. listed on AIM, and in 2014, acquired the Experience Franchise Limited, which included CJ Hole, Ellis & Co., um, White Gates and Parker's brands from Legal & General, taking our footprint, our number of offices across the UK to 282 offices. Um, in 2016, we acquired UMove, which is our hybrid estate agency, and that we'll talk a little bit about later. And in 2017, we rebranded to the property franchise group. As of 2019, as pre previously discussed, we had 58,000 properties under management. And in 2020, we acquired a business and launched our financial services division. So that gives you a little bit of uh, history about the group. In terms of looking at the period we've just been through, and I actually joined the group in February of this year, which was um, an okay time. Uh, to be joining in February, come March, it was very, very different. So first two months of the year, um, we, we, we saw a really encouraging start to the market in both the sales side and the um, uh, letting side. Um, and I think that was out of um, pent up demand as a result of Brexit and the election. Um, and we were very optimistic about trading in, in, in 2020. We got into March and, and the COVID-19 um, uh, COVID hit, and, and obviously we, we had to shut the offices and, and, and start to work from home. So um, we took swift and exhaustive action to mitigate the impact of COVID-19, and David will touch on the success of that in the results section a little bit later. Um, but, but, you know, a, a sort of crazy of that is, you know, we are in a really robust financial position. Uh, uh, we've maintained our cash. We've increased our cash balance of the bank, which is which is tremendous performance. Um, and we've had a you know strong performance across the group following the easing of restrictions, again, that we'll talk about a little bit later. 
Yeah, so, so just to give everyone a bit of background before we get into the numbers for the first half of this year, um, we came to market in the end of 2013, as Garen says, and at that time we were valued about £18 million and uh, we had a, a profit before tax of £1.6 million. So right now in the market today, or well, in terms of results, we're heading towards three times that in, in, in profit before tax and, and not quite three times um, the initial market cap. Um, and gradually over those years, as we've generated cash, um, both um, through organic growth and through acquisitions, uh, we've paid a more progressive dividend. So we um, set a target for ourselves um, of, of driving towards 10p uh, when, when we listed and, and we've kept on that track. Uh, barring um, the COVID crisis and, and what came to play meant we, we bought to and, and did just hold on to our, our dividend at that point in time. And then, um, as it says on this slide, very early on uh, post-COVID impacts to ourselves, we reinstated an interim dividend and made it known that we would be paying a, a dividend uh, in September. So if you can compare this year with last year, and us accountants do that, but I'm not sure there's too much comparison, one pandemic in 100 years um, compared to 2019, I'm not so sure. But, but um, the turnover this year, 5.4 million, exactly the same as, as for the first half of last year. Our management service fees, which is our royalties that we take from our franchise network, which in the main is 9% of the revenue that they generate, uh, we take as that management service fee. Um, slip back slightly. In the traditional brands, so it's all our brands by you move, it dropped by 200,000, split equally between uh, lettings and sales. And in you move, it dropped back as well. I mean, you move is predominantly a sales business. Uh, you shut the market, um, quite frankly, you, you know, for that period of time it shut, that there's very little fee income coming through, and, and that comes out to play in the numbers. And what made up for that shortfall was financial services. Uh, we bought a business at the start of this year, it's a life assurance buying club. Um, I wouldn't say we have gone, well, where, where's this going to take us? We thought it was a good idea. We thought it was worth investing in. We could see where it would get us to. We had an ambition at some point um, set out a few years ago to be able to generate at least 5% of our revenue from financial services. And lo and behold, uh, we bought that business at the start of the year and it has generated 5% of our revenue. And the shortfall in management service fees has been made up for by that revenue for that one business. So we should probably see that as a good buy. Um, certainly be very helpful this first six months. Um, adjusted EBITDA, two and a half million this first six months of 2020, 2.4 last year. Our operating margins held constant at 37%, so we've managed our expenses during this time. Profit for tax, two million this first half of the year, two million last uh, first half of the year of 2019. And um, we, we came into the year with four million of net cash, but we paid off our bank borrowings last year. Because we've managed to maintain our, our profitability, we've added another just over two million to, to our net cash position at the end of June. And that really does put us in a good position. It shows resilience, but of course it puts us in a position one to um, start progressing our dividend policy again, uh, which uh, is, is great news to me because I, I set the target when we when we listed. And uh, but also to start thinking about growth again. And in the last three or four weeks for Gareth and I have very much been about. Uh, where are we going to spend our money? What gives us the best return and, and how quickly will it give us that return? Um, and with that, I'll, I'll hand back to Gareth. Great. Thanks, David. Um, I'm going to talk about COVID. So I'm going to take you back to March and, and, and you know, our, our sort of initial response and what we did as a franchise group to support our franchisees. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the initial sort of emotion was sort of panic when the lockdown um, was put in place from our franchisees. And it was really important that we sort of stepped up as a franchise or to provide high quality support to help them through that initial period. And what we did was we put in place an impact team of, of six or seven people that stayed very, very close to all of the franchisees during that initial period. And, and things were changing on a daily basis. You had government schemes coming out, the business grant scheme, the furlough scheme, um, uh, all the franchisees being worried about whether they had enough money to get through to the end of, you know, the, 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 the lockdown period. Um, and we, you know, we stepped up as a franchisor. We, we, we took on the negotiations with all suppliers and either deferred or cancelled payments. We helped the franchisees understand all these government schemes and help them access the business grants. Um, and the ones that struggled, we, we we put some additional resource in to talk to the councils to make sure that everybody got paid. We we were in daily contact with the franchisees, with HR advice, operational advice, looking at their financial planning, um, and as I say, implemented the cost saving measures uh, uh, centrally 
um, in terms of taking some basic salary cuts, furloughing some staff and uh, suspending co commissions, bonuses and car allowance in the short term. Um, and we also put our financial services strategy on hold during that period. In, in terms of lockdown and working from home, you know, I wouldn't have been a big fan pre-March. Pre um, I think the way both head office and all of the franchisees dealt with that was was nothing short of miraculous. And they were offering, you know, a, a, a near, uh, you know, near as perfect service to their customers very, very quickly, even though they were working remotely. And, you know, we were effective in terms of property management that continued. Some lettings transactional activity was still taking place for key workers. Uh, we, we provided a platform to enable all of the franchisees to offer virtual viewings, which worked you know, remarkably well. Our revenues remained really robust, as David's talked about. Operation margin held, which was great, and our cash actually increased during that period. So overall, everybody at sort of panic initially navigated their way through together um, to what turned out to be a really, really good result. In, in terms of once restrictions ease, that gave us even more challenges because we have to think about, you know, risk assessments for the offices, uh, vulnerable people and what was our line on that, making sure that every branch had PPE, every branch filled in their uh, risk assessments. We continued with the daily updates to franchisees. The furlough scheme changed um, and we had to update them on that. So, so again, we've been very busy over that four month period. But the output from that is the gratitude from the franchisees towards us as their franchisor, which you know we don't talk about that often, um, has been immense. You know, it's built real long-term advantages for us, really great relationships that we can take forward and build on in the future. It's over to you. It is. So we're we're debt free, net cash of six point one million pounds. An operating margin slightly below where I want it to be. I've had a target of 40% and, and slightly off the pace there at the moment. Our weighting is tremendously towards lettings. 73% um, lettings, 27% sales. Um, it, it is dominated by a Marston & Co brand that's, that's a very strong uh, letting agent in this country. Uh, to give you an idea of how stable our revenue streams are, um, the, the, that tenanted managed properties uh, that, that Gareth alluded to, the 58,000, that generated 51% of, of all our royalties. And as you'll see on the slide in a minute, the majority of our income comes from royalties. So it is actually our, our bedrock. Um, we've quite quickly um, shown the ability to sort of flex to meet demand. So uh, no sooner had I, my plans for reducing costs where I could uh, come into fruition, then we could see activity picking up in new move because of uh, the marketing it was still doing. And, and we had to change sort of tack and start thinking about what costs uh, that would inc uh, involve us in and start to go back to suppliers and renegotiate but you know that, that that's that's the dynamic we've got to be quick uh, in this marketplace and a new move has, has, has gained from that um and we, we've been continually providing um support um and negotiating deals way, way beyond just this covid period now because we, we took it as an opportunity to just really um, firm up on, on some arrangements that we had on the right hand side the slide just breaks down um, from June 19, where our cash has come from, but clearly the predominant element of it is from our operations at the end of the day. I mean, that, that's it. We, we haven't got anything else. That, that's what generates most of our cash. We've spent a little bit on assisting our franchisees, 400,000 in buying uh, portfolios that they bring into their own businesses and manage. Uh, and we get some uh, MSF off of that. And clearly they get the income from, from managing those properties. Uh, we spent a little bit on acquiring the business I alluded to in financial services to £200,000. Um, we paid out a dividend that's referring uh, to what got paid out uh, in last financial year because we've not paid out anything till um, in another week uh, of, in this year and you know a little bit of other so we've ended up with 6.1 million um, net of cash at the end of june over to gareth to talk about trading so post lockdown i think i think we were all surprised just how quickly the market came back and and you know this talk now in the marketplace that that we're at levels sort of we haven't seen for 15 years so to look at some of the sort of headline stats since we reopened in tra traditional brands in July, sales agreed pipeline increased increased by 25% over June 2020. So a massive spike in activity and total lets increased by 28% over the, uh, over the same period. So you know, really, really active market. Lots of people, lots of demand, big bubble potentially, but but you know, lots of activity. 
I look at you move even more impressive figures um, sales listings increased by 36 percent to 728 in July 2020 our record month pre-COVID in you move was, was about 430 listings in May 2019 in June they did about 540 uh, which was a record month and in July they did 728 which was a massive you know massive increase on their best ever month and and sales you know, they are a little bit behind in terms of timings, but sales agreed in July 28% up to reach another record of 519 sales. So you know, it's probably a three or four week delay from putting a house on the market to at the moment receiving an offer and agreeing a sale. Website business, so this is a good indication of general interest within the market, would double the normal rates in July 2020. And say like the activity has surprised us, the, the, the sort of volume of the activity. But that's showed no signs of slowing through August and, and, and into September. Um, and, you know, the market has confidence. You know, the stamp duty incentive that the uh, government put in place in June, you could argue wasn't necessary, but it's certainly increased numbers of transactions as a result of it. Um, and, and we see that continuing through to March next year when that stamp duty incentive is removed. So I think, you know, the short term outlook on the housing markets for residential sales, um, is is very positive, um, and lettings throughout the crisis has remained really, really solid. Um, so, um, so, so we're really positive about the um, the short term future. David, yeah, I'm going to give everyone a bit a bit of what sort of uh, insight into where our revenue comes from. So, there were, until this year, there were three main sources of revenue. Uh, we had the revenue from our franchisees turnover so the the revenue they generated we take nine percent of it and, and that's our management service fees um, we sell franchises and we resell franchises and um, so that's our franchise sales income um, we have provided for a long time for um, certain brands the frontline support on some of their um, operating systems uh, the main one these days is called dupix and used in martin and co um, and we, we buy buy that as the master licensee and, and then we basically sub-license that on and we, we provide all the support in, in, uh, in Bournemouth. Um, it's a model we like a lot because we get to know the systems very well, which means we're very responsive to the needs of a franchise network. Um, we know exactly what they're asking and why and we know how to respond to it. It's far more difficult for a, a third party that owns the software to, to do a similar um, job to ourselves. Um, the difference this year is that we've got financial services is on board for the first time and we've got some uh, revenue coming from that and later in the year we'll put our annual report out early next year and um, we'll sort of break that down because it'll be a new segment for us and we'll show what's been generated and, and the costs around it and indeed the profit but for now I thought I'd just put that in, in the graphic on the left hand side so you've got a direct comparative uh, 2019 and 2020 for the first six months of each year and the two things that have changed what well, MSFs dropped back a bit because of transactions um, that weren't being completed during the lockdown uh, within the network and what's come forth from that it is quite a notable growth in financial services revenue and, and also in franchise sales we were still selling franchises in new move at the start of the year we stopped when covid started uh, we restarted so we sold uh, franchises again in june and, and there's a lot of interest there um, we also, uh, as we always do, have some resale work going on in, in the traditional brands. Um, and, and that this year has, has generated um, quite, a, quite a decent level of, of revenue compared to the last couple of years. Um, so long may that continue. Uh, I think it's just going to take you through, uh, if it'll get to us, yes, it will, what's been happening um, with our royalties, our MSF within the traditional brands. So I've broken it down, lettings and sales. Left hand side is lettings and you can see post lockdown things have come back very quickly and that's transactions that's people moving between one tenanted property and another they've picked up very quickly um, post the season of the lockdown and we are running about at the same levels as we did this time last year and now you know all being well that should continue. Um, the sales side's a different picture. Lots of activity, listings, sales agreed, but yet to show up as fees. And there's a time lag between a sale agreed and that of, uh, of us seeing, showing some fees for that of three to four months. So right now, September, as we start to come into it, yeah, and Gareth and I are looking for the first signs of that coming through. Okay, there's nothing to say it won't do, but it's just quite noticeable on that graph that it hasn't yet. And the next slide shows you the same thing for you move. It talks about transactions completed overall on the left hand side. And again, you can see market opened up and uh, you move transactions started to be completed. 
But if you notice on the right hand side, you've got two graphs, you've got the sales transactions and lettings transactions. Sales is much more important to you move than lettings because it's a major part of its activity. And there you see fees coming through because that's fee income, that's, that's transactions completed. And so uh, it, it's definitely true that uh, through the marketing that you move maintained that once the market started to look like it was going to open up, they were very fast to win instructions from clients and they've been very quick to convert that into revenue. Uh, which is terrific and uh, you know, long may that continue this year. So um, a trend that uh, we we're keeping a very close eye on. I think with that, I hand back to you, Gareth. Okay, so, so we're going to talk about our growth and, and, and you know, where we see the future. But, but you know, in terms of talking about the changing market that we question on quite a lot, um, you know, we're really fortunate to have a hybrid brand in, in, in the UMU brand that has uh, performed exceptionally well um, over the last couple of years. And you know, it's fair to say there is increasing interest in that sort of self-employed model from uh, agents that, as a result of COVID, either thought they were going to lose their jobs um, or wanted a different work-life balance. Um, so, so we've seen, uh, you know, a, a, an increase in the number of people inquiring about becoming a, a, a UMU franchisee. Um, if you look at the wider space, there are other challenges coming into that 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 space, but at the same time. The people that were there two or three years ago are beginning to sort of uh, fall back. So Purple Bricks, you know, they, they're, they're high. They were you know, pretty successful at taking a high percentage of the um, online marketplace, had 700 uh, local property experts working for them. They're now down to about 300 um, and, and, and sort of seems to be unraveling a little bit. Yopa hasn't really got off the ground. Charles Dunstan's vehicle, how simple has just been rebranded to strike and again isn't really creating too much traction. So we're really proud of the uh, the Yumu brand and the fact that you know every year is getting you know more successful, more profitable. Um, so changing customer preferences. And you know, if you look at the percentage of stock going to an online agent as opposed to the traditional method, you may think that that, that percentage is increasing. It's actually not. It's it's sort of holding firm between six and seven percent um which which is great news for the traditional brands because 93 percent of people still want to use a traditional high street estate agent um what i think the customer wants is a different way of being served and i think what you you, you move has captured is that 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 customer centric approach which now the local traditional brands are picking up on um and how how is that being achieved that's a growing use of technology to drive communication and efficiency to give the, cons the the consumer a better overall experience and and we're trying to embrace all of that within our growth initiatives that i'm going to go on and talk about now so david's talked about our results and they are very robust um, they are very impressive we've restarted the dividend which is great for investors but all of that you know we hope will continue but we do have a number of growth initiatives that we believe if we can focus in these areas will take the result from good to great. And that's our plan over the next two to three years, okay? And I'm gonna articulate what each one of those are. Um, so the first one, developing sales activity within the traditional brands. So our traditional brands um, are superb letting agents um, and they do okay on residential sales, but there is um, a massive opportunity for them to focus in that area and drive their sales activity. Um, and they have a huge desire to want to do that, but they need help from us to be able to do that. So we're we're you know embarking on a journey with our franchisees to um, upskill them, to help them, to help recruit for them, to get the right person to do that role for them, so they can really focus on developing their lettings business and employ somebody that they trust to develop their sales business. Um, and and. That, that activity has started over the last four weeks and is already in the trial branch is showing some really positive signs. So, so that's key part one. And that ties into the third growth initiative, which is financial services. So I'll come back to you, move recruitment. But um, you know, we, we need sales activity to drive a financial services business. So um, we, we took the decision at the, last, at the end of last year to acquire um, a financial services business. Financial services growth has been on the agenda within the group for the last two to three years. Um, and Mark Graves, the, 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 the um, chap we brought in to head up that uh, department, is an industry veteran. He knows everybody within the financial services business. 
um, has great knowledge um, and, and has defined a plan that we, we, you know, we want to back, which is a buy and build strategy um, to enable us to grow a financial services business within the group that will look like 100 financial consultants by the end of next year. So that's our stated aim. We want to build a financial services business that has 100 self-employed financial consultants servicing the brand um, by the end of 2021. Um, and if there's any questions on that, we'll pick them up at the end. Going back to point two, you move recruitment. I've talked about how well you move has done. Nick Neal, the MD, has done a fantastic job for us. We now have 110 franchisees with 230 people we're working within those franchisee groups. Okay. And again, our stated aim is that we want to double that number to 220 franchisees with circa 500 people working within them. Um, and you know, we've committed to a recruitment strategy for Nick to be able to do that. Um, and, and you know, there are other players in the space. You know, there are, you know, Keller Williams have come over from the US as a sort of realtor based model. Uh, we've got a company called EXP that have come into the market, but but there's there's been a definite increase in um, people willing to look at the self-employed model. Um, our self-employed model is better um, than everybody else's, but I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, but we do actually pay more money back to the franchisee than any of the other models in the marketplace. Um, so so I believe you know we need to you know get our story out there, talk in the trade press. I think there'll be a captive audience over the next 12 months to be able to uh, recruit more franchisees and, and, and hit that target that we've set this week. Um, so that's key uh, growth initiative three. Um, acquisitions is twofold. Um, we've been very successful over the um, uh, last five years in growing um, our individual franchisees portfolios and in turn growing our, uh, our own managed portfolio up to, to 58,000 managed properties. Um, and we want to continue that and accelerate it. So um, a number of our franchisees, probably about 150 of them, have committed that if the right acquisition came up in the right area, they would want to buy it. Um, and our job is to try and source those opportunities for them and then help them manage the process of acquiring that business. Okay, So the expertise in, in settling that business down um, into um, our franchisees' business. Um, so that's that's growth area one from the from an acquisitions perspective, and then growth um, uh, acquisition point two would be um, consolidate consolidation of the franchise space. So you know there are a number of franchise businesses um, offering similar to what we we offer, and and if there was an opportunity that presented itself, we would take that very very seriously. Um, so they're, they're, they're the two aspects of our acquisition strategy. Um, and then we talked about changing consumer habits. Digital marketing pretty much underpins everything that we're trying to do. So, you know, a, a, a customer journey to ensure that, you know, our, our customer acquisition strategy is right. Um, the service of those consumers is, is right through automated comms and, and talking to them at the right time about the right things. That will then drive leads back into the branches for residential sales or lettings or recruitment or financial services leads. So a digital marketing strategy that underpins all of the things that we're trying to achieve is the final part of the strategic growth initiatives that we launched yesterday at a half year results presentation. So outlook, we expect uh, results for the full year to be in line with pre-COVID expectations, which, you know, again, go back to March. I don't think we ever thought we'd be saying that. So that's a real positive. We've got an incredibly strong balance sheet in place. And I'll remind you, £6.1 million in the bank and absolutely no debt, which is very unusual in the space we operate. Record performance is delivered um, once the office is reopened, which is really encouraging. Um, uh, a, a commitment that we want to pursue those strategic initiatives that are already in place, along with reviewing at all times any potential new opportunities that come along. Um, and we believe there's a really substantial growth opportunity ahead, and we remain really excited by the group's long term prospects. I'd just like to thank everybody for taking the time out today to, to, to listen to our presentation. Hope you found it useful, and thank you very much for your time today.